warm welcome. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, so as Vlad mentioned there, latency has been a problem on Android and doing real-time processing has also been a problem. It's historically been a very difficult problem um, and something which is, is a real challenge to get right on Android, hence the reason for the talk. So today we're gonna to talk about three things which help to do better real-time processing on Android. So the first thing is the ecosystem and how we've worked over the past five years to bring down audio latency across the entire Android ecosystem. We'll also talk about Oboe, which is a C++ library, which was designed to make it easy for uh, real-time processing. Uh, it's a C++ library, and uh, its goal is to provide the best possible audio latency across the widest range of devices. And really, kind of the meat of our presentation today is to build a real-time processing app. So we're, we're gonna build the most important parts of this app um, and demo it live. So fingers crossed for that. So in terms of ecosystem, um, you know, th there's sort of a long-standing joke that audio latency is terrible on, on Android. And that was true up until about 2015. And in 2015, we launched the Pro Audio flag, which was a flag to indicate that an Android device has 20 milliseconds input to output latency. It's called the Pro Audio flag. And all Pixel devices and, all, and some Nexus devices have conformed to this standard from 2015 onwards. And from around about 2017 on, onwards, uh, many o OEMs are also um, conforming to this standard. Some conform to the standard, some are like in the ballpark. So kind of the ecosystem as a whole is, is moving in the right direction. And just to kind of demonstrate this, um, I grabbed a few devices that I had lying around the office this week just to, to, to run some latency tests. So uh, Razer 2 with, uh, with 28 milliseconds, Samsung Galaxy S9, which is one of the most uh, popular devices uh, ever, ever made, has latency in the sort of 25 to 30 millisecond mark. Um, Sony are also, uh, many of their flagships have excellent audio latency. Um, a shout out to Pixelbook, which was released in 2017, uh, which I got the test results today for, which is around 20, 28 to 35 milliseconds. So um, all of these devices perfectly capable of doing uh, real-time processing for, for most use cases. Uh, lastly, the Google Pixel 3a, um, we're running some tests yesterday, and it's the first Android device I have ever seen to get a sub 10 millisecond round-trip latency. So uh, extremely, extremely happy about that. Another thing which is driving down latency is the Google Smart Hearing Project. And in case you're not aware of it, it's an app which uses your phone's microphone in order to amplify the, uh, the sound around you. And it does so all sorts of uh, clever dynamics processing and uh, noise cancellation in order to improve your hearing. It has over five million installs. Um, it's available on Google Play, and it also uses Oboe, this library. So, on to Oboe. Oboe is a C++ library for building real-time audio apps. Essentially, it's a wrapper around the two native audio APIs on Android. Uh, it uses A-Audio, which is like the new, cool, best uh, library for doing uh, anything with audio uh, on Android, but it's only available from API 27. If that's not av available, Oboe falls back to using OpenSLES uh, to give you coverage on, on all the older devices. Oboe is used by many popular apps. Um, it, you know, we saw the Smart Hearing Project there, which is using it. Uh, SoundCloud is using Oboe, and they, they actually published an article rec recently talking about how they reduced their average latency by 10% just by, by using Oboe. Um, and there's <coughs> also some very, very popular apps which uh, I'm not allowed to name, but uh, are using Oboe. In fact, apps that are using Oboe uh, have installs of over 4 billion. So it's kind of battle-hardened, ready for, for production use. If you're doing anything with audio on Android and you're using native code, C++, then just use Ovo. 
So, uh, today, actually, we, we launched a new version of OVO 1.3, and I'm going to hand over to Atne, who's going to talk about some of the features there. Thank you. Okay, so the first big feature uh, in OVO 1.3 uh, is resampling and format conversion. Uh, so a lot of the times, traditionally, when developers wanted to use OVO, they have their audio data in some predefined format. In this case, for example, they want an audio stream uh, to have a sample rate of 44,100, um, but maybe you know the native device sample rate is 48,000. In that case, you wouldn't get a low latency stream. And that was kind of biting a lot of developers where the only thing that they were doing wrong is kind of they wanted to output at the wrong sample rate or the wrong channel count, something similar. So if you, the requested sample rate didn't match, uh, then you wouldn't get your low latency stream. And that could have very severe consequences for your app's performance. So now in Oboe 1.3, uh, we introduced a bunch of opt-in kind of settings for an audio stream. So either they can set sample rate conversion quality to a specific sample rate conversion quality, uh, or they can set channel conversion or format conversion to allowed. And in combination, all three of these methods will allow the, uh, will allow the developer to kind of get a low latency stream with Oboe doing all the conversion under the hood um, with no kind of performance penalty other than that conversion itself. Sorry, just, just to add there, uh, a, a question which was asked to me yesterday was, um, why don't you switch on sample rate conversion by default? And the reason is because there is some computational overhead. So that's why we leave it up to you to switch it on if you want to use it. So, yeah. The next big addition in OBO 1.3 uh, is the addition of the managed stream as the main way that and uh, end developers interface with OBO. Uh, so previously, if you wanted to open an audio stream, OBO would give you kind of a raw pointer to signify ownership of the audio stream. Now, as we all know, using raw pointers to signify ownership is something we want to avoid um, in modern C++ conventions. And we were actually seeing a lot of developers would submit issues to our GitHub where they, the bugs that were either being caused by lifecycle or scope issues where raw pointers were going, uh, raw pointers were trying to be accessed after they were deleted, issues of that nature. So kind of to resolve those issues, we introduced a managed stream type. So now streams have scoped ownership. So whenever the managed stream is in scope, after it's been opened, it's a valid stream. And if it's not in scope, it's no longer a valid stream. So once it goes out of scope, it's automatically closed and cleaned up by Oboe uh, instead of leaving that to the developers. Cool. Uh, so in summary, we, we've added uh, resampling and format conversion. Uh, we've got the managed stream, which makes it easier to handle uh, stream life cycles. We've updated all the sample code, and you can get it all on GitHub. So Oboe is, is open source, and we're taking full requests. So um, if there's any issues, we're, we're, you know, we can fix them in the open rather than it being closed. So um, here's a picture of my cat. <laughs> I promised cats. There's a cat. I wouldn't want anyone to ask for a refund. So uh, he is addicted to licking the acoustic foam in my studio. So yeah, <laughs> read into that what you will. Um, okay, so now on to the kind of meat of our, our talk. We are going to build a real-time processing app. Uh, before we get into the actual live coding, uh, I'll just explain exactly what, what the app does. So we have a Pixel 2 device here, which is uh, connected via this USB audio interface here, or it will be when I plug it in. Um, and that is taking an input from this, and I'll just unplug it. So. This is a music box uh, in a box, and it also has uh, a little piezoelectric transducer in it. So I'm just, con and I've connected that up to just a, a little jack here, which, um, so I'm gonna take the output from the music box, it's gonna go into the phone and the app and do the processing inside the app, and then the app is gonna output, again via this USB audio interface, hopefully to these two speakers here. That's the theory. So, okay, so before we, yeah, before we get into live coding, uh, we'll just explain the uh, architecture so you, you know what we're doing here. So um, we have this object called a duplex engine, and that's responsible for setting up the real-time objects which are uh, in use uh, whilst, whilst the app is doing its processing. So these are the input stream, uh, a duplex callback, so this is uh, an object which will be called each time the output stream uh, requires more data. So every time the output stream requires more data, we have this callback. We then go to read from the input stream. 
and then we have this uh, data movement back through the callback uh, from the input stream. We do the processing inside the callback, and then we pass that processed data to the output stream. Okay, so I'll hand back to Atne. He's going to talk us through the live code. Perfect. Uh, so here you can, uh, we just have the implementation uh, for our duplex engine class, uh, like Don just mentioned. Uh, so the brunt of its responsibility uh, is actually setting everything up. So we'll go ahead and get started with that. Uh, so the first thing that it needs to do is create our input stream. So we're just going to kind of define a create input stream method, um, and then hopefully we can generate that automatically. Perfect. Uh, so we're just going to be using Oboe's, uh, Oboe's builder objects in order to configure and build uh, an input stream for us here. So we're going to try a feature out uh, in Android Studio called Code Snippets. So in theory, this should save us a lot of typing. So we'll see. Perfect. So yeah, right. essentially, we, we declare our builder, uh, and then we're just setting various device properties um, that we, we want to specify. So in particular, we're going to be processing floats today, uh, so we're going to specify that, uh, as well as, oh. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, as well as a sample rate, um, and then we're going to be doing mono to mono processing. So we're going to set our cha channel count to one, uh, as well as our direction to input, which is very important because Obo streams are output by default. Um, and then the final thing that we're going to do is we're going to open our managed stream into an input stream object. So, so I'm just using uh, Android Studio's autocomplete here. Um, anything you see in red uh, generally has some sort of uh, quick help. So I'm just doing option enter, and I, it gives me loads of different options that I can uh, just add, add the, uh, well, fix the issue. So I'll create a new field. Uh, that adds a managed stream into the header. Um, it's actually created it as a reference, and I don't want it as a reference, so I'll just delete that. And then one quick thing uh, before we return to the constructor, we actually want to make sure uh, that we leverage Oboe's new features in terms of format and sample rate conversion. And so to do that, we have another snippet here where we're Conf telling the stream to allow for sample rate conversion, allow for channel count conversion, uh, even though we probably won't need most of these, but just to make sure that this runs in low latency on the widest possible set of devices. Yeah, so, so just to illustrate that, we're outputting in 48,000 uh, 48, frames a second. On some older Samsung devices, the native sample rate will be 44.1. So by using these three, uh, this method in particular, we're guaranteeing that we're going to get a, a low latency stream. OK, so now kind of ret to return to our constructor, we have our input stream uh, kind of created. Uh, the next thing that we need to do is build that middle layer, so the duplex callback. So we're going to create uh, our duplex callback. Uh, so what we've actually done is we've already kind of defined the broad outlines of this callback class, uh, in particular what its constructor is going to take in. Um, so our constructor is going to need a reference to our input stream, since our callback needs to know where the input stream is to read from it. Uh, and it's going to take a processing function. So for right now, we're not going to do any processing. We're just going to do pass-through. Uh, and we'll kind of dive into what that processing function is later. Uh, but for now, um, we're just going to create that, that type using uh, std make unique, so we don't have to deal with any raw pointers. Um, and then we're just going to pass in a reference to the input stream that we just created. Um, as well as kind of an empty function, since we're not doing any processing. And the way that's going to take shape uh, in C++ is we're going to pass in a lambda that does nothing of the correct type. So this is a lambda that operates on two float pointers and does absolutely nothing with them. So that should be enough to create our callback. Um, we probably want to add that to our header as well. Perfect. Uh, and then now that our callback's created, the last thing that we need to create is our output stream. So we can kind of follow the same pattern, mostly what we did for our input stream. Uh, and in order to save us rewriting some code, what we're actually going to do um, is try and refactor most of our input stream, uh, input stream behavior into kind of a common method. So Android Studio has something for this as well. Um, so essentially, we pulled out all of that code into a get builder method, and Don did that very quickly uh, Sorry, with, uh, <laughs> with uh, key bindings. But essentially, what this does is it pulled out all of that behavior into a common method, so we can kind of leverage that again. Let oh. me do it again. Just uh, I was worried that I'd forgotten the uh, key shortcut. So, so what you can do is highlight 
all of the code you want to extract, command option M, and you've got this, it's very tiny, but it says extract function up here, uh, and it essentially creates a new method, copies all the code into it, and then refactors your existing method to call that new method. So, there we go. Okay, so that kind of got, got rid of a lot of kind of duplicate code for us. Uh, the main things that are gonna be different between our input and our output stream, uh, the first is gonna be the direction. So our direction uh, is gonna be output. Now this, that's the default in Oboe, but we can just be explicit about that. And then the other big thing is that our output stream actually needs to have a registered callback, since our output stream is gonna be calling us back whenever it needs new data. So we're just gonna go ahead and set the callback uh, to the callback that we just created in our engine. Uh, with the one caveat to know, uh, we're gonna use uh, .get on the unique pointer to our callback. Um, unfortunately, Oboe still wants a raw pointer to its callback, so we're gonna have to reach under the hood. Uh, and kind of the one thing to keep in mind with that is as when, when we're kind of creating the duplex engine, we need to be very careful that it never goes out of scope. So we don't want our callback to get deleted while Oboe is still using it. So we have to make sure that our duplex engine kind of persists across our entire stream lifecycle. That's right, and we're not passing ownership here. We're just uh, passing uh, the, the raw pointer so that um, it, the callback can be called. Exactly, uh, and then finally to, um, so we can, open, we can open the stream again uh, into another variable. In this case, we'll just call it output stream, uh, do much of the same stuff. Um, and then kind of after all of that, the last thing that we need to do now that we have all of our objects created is simply start our streams. Uh, so we're gonna call start on our input stream, uh, and then following that, we're gonna call start on our output stream. Uh, now one ca caveat to add is that kind of throughout this entire process, there are a lot of methods that could result, uh, return errors if anything goes wrong. Um, and right now we're not doing any of that checking. So really, like on most of these starts, on most of these opens, we should be checking for errors and handling them gracefully, but we're not gonna worry about that right, right now. Uh, so I think with that, we're ready to, ready to switch back. Here, I can hand it okay. to you, yeah. <laughs> so now we're gonna implement what happens inside the callback. Um, so we're gonna start by zeroing the output buffer. So what happens is when we get called, we get a container array that can just contains like junk data. It's, data. it's a container array that we need to write into. So the first thing we're gonna do is write zeros into it to make sure that our starting point is silence. After that, we're gonna read from the input stream we're gonna do our processing on that data that we got from the input stream, and then we're gonna pass it, the process data, back to the output stream. So in an ideal world, when we start the input stream, we would immediately be getting uh, valid data that was perfectly acceptable to do processing on. In reality, what's happening is the audio codec on the Android device takes a while to spin up. So we are likely to get uh, bad data for the first few frames or the first few bursts um, in our input stream. And then we start getting valid data. So before we do anything, we need to clear down this input stream. But the real question is, how much data do we need to clear down before we start reading? So uh, let's talk about that briefly. Yeah, so one thing that we really didn't mention when we were looking at the previous uh, slide about the architecture of the app is there's two buffers that we really need to worry about when we have a duplex stream. So now not only do we have an output buffer uh, where audio, audio output is being consumed from, but we also have an input buffer that's being filled up with audio input from whatever device. Um, so audio input's coming in, filling up the buffer. Uh, then our callback is going to read from the front of that buffer, so it's gonna grab uh, the oldest audio input, uh, gonna do some processing, and then copy it to the end of our audio output buffer. Finally, that audio output will eventually be output, but the thing to note here is that that output buffer still functions in the same way as it would if you were only dealing with an output stream, which is it functions as underrun protection. So if our callback was ever to get preempted or we ever miss a deadline or anything like that, um, if we didn't have any buffering at all, what would happen is we would glitch because we wouldn't be able to meet our deadlines. Um, but what a buffer allows us to do is if we miss once or twice, uh, we consume some of that buffer and we get some underrun protection. So kind of like traditionally what you would see when you have just an output stream, our audio, buff our, our audio output buffer still gives us underrun protection. 
no, we haven't really gotten to what the input buffer does yet. So our output buffer, uh, we recommend kind of two bursts for underrun protection regardless of what you're doing. So whether uh, you're doing kind of this duplex setup or you just are dealing with audio output, you want a couple bursts for underrun protection. But obviously our input buffer, we're not, not yet sure. So in an ideal scenario, um, once our stream is kind of up and running, not worrying about our output buffer, uh, audio data comes into our input buffer and then immediately gets called back goes straight to the output buffer, maybe after some processing, and then immediately flies out the other end. So that's an example of like a total zero latency scenario. Obviously, that's too much to hope for. Um, so what often can happen is that when, we, when our input buffer fills up and we get a callback, uh, we actually don't have the requisite number of frames uh, from our input stream. So our input stream hasn't actually completely filled up the amount that we need um, to do uh, whatever processing we plan to do. So in that case, if we call back early, our input stream isn't filled up the right amount, and then we underrun because we don't have enough data to do processing, and then that gets passed out to the user. Uh, so that's not a good experience. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if we have a large input buffer, when we call back, we essentially have a ton of latency that we're not really getting any bang for the buck for. So we're not getting any extra protection in the same way we would in our output buffer. We're not getting any underrun protection or anything like that. We just get excessive latency. So kind of the trade-off that we would recommend is you keep z uh, maybe like half to one burst of buffer uh, in the, on the input side, and then in that scenario, uh, you get protection from that, that callback jitter, uh, and on the output side, like we mentioned, two bursts for underrun protection. So two bursts on the output side, one burst maximum on the input side. And hopefully that should be the best budget in terms of you don't deal with too much latency, uh, just kind of three bursts of total latency, but you have reasonably robust protection against things that might, might go wrong uh, on a wide variety of Android devices. So time to implement that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to head over to our callback itself. Um, so this is the actual meat of our callback method. So this is the on audio ready callback that Obo will call back whenever it's ready for new data. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're actually just going to cast um, the void star pointer that uh, Obo provides us uh, into a float star since we know that we're dealing with float data. Uh, so, so, so this is the container array that we're going to write into. And we also get the number of frames uh, which uh, we, we are required to, to write. So, yeah, we'll just cast that. And that should hopefully make things easiest, easier for us later on in the callback. Um, and then the next thing that we're going to do is, like we mentioned, we want to silence out our input buffer uh, or our output buffer before we, before we do any processing. So an easy way to do that is just to use std fill. Uh, and this just takes pointers to the beginning and ending blocks of our memory. So output data is a pointer to our beginning block. Um, num frames, that so gives us a pointer to our ending block. Uh, and zero is just the value we're filling it up with. So we're silencing it out. Now, uh, before we kind of get into the meat of our callback, uh, there's an important check that we need to do, which is since starting streams is asynchronous, we don't actually know that the input stream has started yet. Uh, even though we're getting callbacks on our output stream. So what that means is we need to make sure it is in order to not deal with any nasty errors if our input stream starts uh, a little bit later than our output stream. So we're just going to check that our, our input stream has actually started. Uh, and then once, uh, once we have a started input stream, we kind of have those two cases we mentioned before. Either our stream has already started and it's well, well and along the way, uh, or it's still kind of in the process of starting, in that spin-up phase. Uh, and a way we're going to implement that check is we just have this counter. Uh, we're going to call it m spin up callbacks. Uh, and what that does is it's just going to count uh, the first, in this case, 10, which is a little arbitrary. Uh, but the first 10 callbacks, it's going to do that special behavior where we clear out the buffer. Um, so kind of thinking about that first 10 callbacks, what we want to do is clear out the input buffer like we mentioned. Uh, but we want to leave that one burst of data in the buffer for protection. Um, so a good way to do that uh, pretty easily is we can actually now check the, um, check the amount of frames uh, that's in, that are in the input buffer with the get available frames method. Um, so to call the read method, we just need, um, we need to provide still some, uh, a buffer to read into. So in that case, we just have a local buffer called mProcessing buffer. Uh, and then the number of frames that we're going to read um, is the number of available frames minus the number of frames that we want to leave left, which is num frames, which was provided to us. So 
Here we're going to use dot value uh, because obo returns uh, obo returns results uh, with error code, so dot value to get the value, um, and then we're subtracting the number of frames. So essentially, what we're doing is we're reading the exact amount uh, so that the amount left in the buffer is num frames, um, which is kind of that ideal starting state where we want to work from, where we have an almost empty buffer except for that one burst of padding. Uh, and then kind of the last parameter uh, is zero because we want to make sure all of our calls are non-blocking. Uh, so this is just the timeout for our read. Uh, we're not going to block at all. So that's kind of the starting, uh, which in some sense is a bit, uh, is the more complicated uh, end of it. Now that we've gone to our streams kind of in synchronization, it's up and running, uh, the main thing that we just need to do is uh, outline those three steps. So read from the uh, input stream. Uh, and in this case, we just need to read num frames because uh, that's what's, uh, that's what's being requested by our output stream. Uh, and we're reading it into this temporary processing buffer, uh, kind of like a wet, wet storage area to do our processing. Uh, don't want to ask Siri for anything. Um, same thing, no timeout uh, to make sure that we don't block, uh, which is very important in a callback. Um, now, read result is actually going to give us the number of frames that were actually read. And with that, we can, uh, I guess we can um, essentially call dot value to figure out the frames that were read. Uh, and then now we have some input data that's been successfully read into our processing buffer. Now we need to process it. Um, and this is where that processing function that was passed into this callback comes into play. So we're just going to call that processing function. Um, for now, it's not going to do anything so it's, we're, since we're just doing pass through. Um, but that'll become important later. Uh, but we're just going to call it on uh, the beginning and the end of our processing buffer. Uh, don't forget to use get. So we're calling our processing function uh, on the block of data that we just obtained. Uh, and then the last thing that we need to do is simply copy it over. Uh, so similar to above, we're just going to copy our processing buffer over to our output stream. Um, nothing, nothing too crazy. And then the third parameter of SD copy is just the location to actually copy to. And then the last thing that we need to do uh, is just return a data callback result continue uh, so obo knows to keep calling us back. Um, hopefully nothing has gone wrong. Uh, if we were actually shipping this to production, we would do error checking for a lot of these reads uh, and things like that and return a data callback result stop to make sure that we stop getting callback if anything errors out. But hopefully uh, this should be enough to get pass through working for us. Okay, so I'm just going to install this. Um, unplug this cable which I'm using to deploy. Plug in this USB-C hub. Run the app. It's crashed immediately. That's always a good start. Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, it's crashing, <laughs> crashing immediately. Um, so what have we done wrong? Let's see. So My guess would be in the constructor. Practice. If I plug this back in, we should be able to get the crash from Android Studio. One second, I think you're, um, you're Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, what was that? After you start the input stream, that doesn't seem like it's the right thing. Uh, do you want to go back to the instructor? Create output stream. Oh, this, this isn't the create input stream method. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> so what code was debugging? in the wrong place. Fantastic. Okay. I dog eared it for later. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, so. Hopefully, that should be the only issue. Okay. Okay, it's running. It's a good start. Uh, so, what we should hear is just um, a direct copy. So, no processing. Uh, the noise from this music box should come out of the speakers. So uh, an extra challenge for you, I have these cards, these printed cards, which have songs on them. If anyone knows the song, uh, shout out. I don't have any prizes, but you, know, you win, win a lot of glory. Okay, ready? No, hang on. It's not coming out. Is it not coming out? I can't tell if it's, is it coming out of the speakers or no? Okay, so we might have made 
might have made another mistake. Is your volume up? Yep, my volume's up. Okay, let's check our code. Is, are the speakers on? Okay, the speakers, the are, speakers on. are on. Okay, right. Sorry about this. Okay, uh, again, we have to debug this, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, my guess would be the callback. Um, so, let's make sure we're doing everything we need to do. We're doing. Initialized here. So we're reading. Um, sort function. I mean, we don't have to call the processing function. But all of that should be good. Are we starting the streams? Did we, did we make sure? Uh, they're both one channel. Glitch if it wasn't. The callback is set. The intermediate buffer is set in uh, the constructor here. So it, it just gets the capacity from the input stream buffer. So if I can write the code for a sine wave in a few seconds. What is, is that from? Uh, from the processing buffer to the output data. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, are we 100% sure it's a process buffer? That's a good question. Um, it might be any, it might be the USB hub, it might be the, <laughs> the audio dongle. So there, there are a lot of points of failure here. It's no? No. Check one. Check, check, check. No, it's not. It's, it's a code issue. Okay, so it's a code issue. Okay. Um, so let's. Worked in rehearsal every time. <laughs> let's, let's run through one more time and hopefully we can find the issue. Okay, we, we do have a commit which uh, we can roll back to. So. Um, we don't want to spend too long trying to debug up here. So, uh, so we do a read. Um, clear that out. Read in that. Not. What was that? Yeah, but I mean, we've never had an issue with that before. I don't know if you want to do like a diff or something. Uh, no, I'll just switch to final. Okay, that's fine then. Okay. Just pretend you didn't see that. <laughs> It's empty, it should yeah, still true, work, yeah. But yeah, should. Okay, so I'm gonna try that. So the build. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, there's so. <laughs> so it's passing passing through now, which is good. <laughs> we'll edit that bit out, that's fine. Uh, okay, so here we go. Can anyone name this tune? Uh, now your music box is. John Kitch. Oh, don't tell me this is broken as well. Come on. Yes. Okay. You went. 
<laughs> yeah, I ran out of paper there. Okay, so now uh, oh, switch so we, back. we have we have an app which uh, is outputting um, just just the input to the output. So now what we need to do is add some effects to that. Yeah. So uh, kind of before we get into uh, individual effects, um, it's really useful to think about effects in kind of the most abstract way possible. Uh, so one possible way of doing this uh, is using C++'s STD function as kind of an anonymous wrapper of any functional type, uh, to, so to say, that operates on some block of audio data. Uh, so in our case, we're going to enforce that it's on floats, uh, but even this is a little bit arbitrary. Uh, but in any case, any audio function or any audio effect function uh, essentially just iterates over some array of uh, floats, which represent audio data, and operates on that data in place. Uh, and the advantage of this is if you want to kind of have a uniform interface in which to chain audio effects with as minimal an interface as possible. So without kind of having to implement uh, some interface with a process function or many other interface functions. So this is kind of the simplest way to get that uh, homogeneous interface. So for example, uh, if we want to chain together uh, an echo effect, uh, then a distortion, and then a flange, uh, one way that we could think about this is just a list of functions, let's call it function list, uh, and the main information that our class needs to have is just a container of all of these functions. So because of kind of that uh, STD function um, interface uh, that I mentioned before, our container just needs to hold an STD function, any functional object, um, that operates on a beginning and ending float pointer, so some block of audio data. So that's our container for our uh, functional effects. Um, and then here we can kind of see how we can transparently forward a function, we can transparently forward something like adding an effect to just adding it to our collection of functions, so adding it to our vector. Uh, if we wanted to do this uh, properly, we would also make it uh, real-time safe, uh, which is something that the talk earlier today morning talked a lot about, uh, but that's not the case here. Uh, and then the main thing is that we can abstract away this entire, the entire kind of function list as well as one big audio effect. So in that case, uh, we can override the uh, kind of the parentheses operator. Now we can treat the entire function list as just one big function. Uh, that operates on a beginning and ending block of data. So we started with kind of these uh, individual function objects that operate on blocks of audio data. We made a function list that holds a lot of these together and exhibits that same behavior. It's again just operating on some beginning and ending block of audio data. And now kind of to go back to that, we're not going to implement uh, the function list. Uh, we're just going to kind of add it to our engine in this case. So we just have a function list um, as a member of our class. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to add some effects to it. Um, this is an echo effect. Uh, it's just a pretty simple uh, delay line based effect that I implemented. Um, we can also add maybe a vibrato effect. Um, and I think the parameters on that you might want to try like um, one. one. Yeah, one and three. And then we could also maybe add like a distortion or something like that. And what we can do, uh, and this kind of demonstrates the, uh, the advantages of SCE function, is if we're not dealing with anything with state, we can just pass in the name of some function. So distortion is a function uh, that's in the namespace, um, is, is in some namespace that I defined, and we're just passing that directly as a function to our function list, and hopefully it should handle the rest for us. Now the last thing that we're doing is before we had that empty lambda that wasn't really uh, doing any processing in our callback, uh, now we've just changed it so that our lambda uh, tell, essentially tells the callback to call the function list on whatever data it gets. So we're transparently forwarding that function list uh, to the callback um, through kind of an anonymous uh, small little lambda. Then that should be, uh, it should be it in terms of, oh, make sure we don't have a, Oh, we might have not untemplated. Why don't we get rid of the vibrato to stick with the, or the vibrato and the distortion to stick with the echo for now. Okay, so we'll just test it with that. Yeah, just the echo. Uh, 
Uh, did it build or? Uh, the deployment target changed. So. Oh. <laughs> Uh, your USB, yeah, USB hub. <laughs> so unfortunately, when you have these type of processing apps, if you don't implement some sort of feedback control, if you're not plugged into like some interface like this, you may have some really, uh, really headache-inducing feedback. Okay, so we should now. Yep, there it is. Hear the echo effect. So another tune for you. And this might be a little bit harder since now it's running through a bit of an echo. So extra bonus points. Is your music box gone? Oh, hopefully it doesn't rip. Ah, oh, there we go. Anyone? Yes. thing I wanted to, to demo was um, MIDI. So imagine you've got an effects processing app and you want to control it via some kind of foot pedal um, or some kind of slider. So I have a, a custom built MIDI controller here which just sends a single control change message when I move the slider like this. So to implement MIDI, um, the first thing to remember is that the MIDI support was added in Marshmallow, so it only works on API 23 and above. Um, so you, any MIDI code you need to wrap in, in an if statement checking for, for being run on Marshmallow. Once you've done that, you need to listen for new uh, MIDI device connections, and this can be actually plugging in a USB MIDI device or connecting over Bluetooth. Once you receive a, uh, a connection, you open the device, you connect that MIDI device's output port to a receiver inside the app, and then listen for incoming MIDI messages. So if we just take a look at the code there, uh, I'm not gonna live code this, uh, but I do have the code already written here. So I have my activity, uh, it's all written in Kotlin. I have a, a check statement to see whether or not I'm running on Marshmallow. Um, I register uh, a device callback here to be alerted when a new device is added. And that's when this callback is called. Um, then I set up my MIDI res res receiver here and connect it to the device's output port. And inside my, my MIDI receiver class here, every time a new control change message or any MIDI uh, message is sent, this method is called onSend. So I just have a bit of um, bit of code here which takes out the second byte which is a control change value and passes it down to my, uh, my duplex engine which controls all my effects. So I'll just show that. Now actually what is happening is this function list that we're talking about earlier, all that's happening is I'm actually just creating a new effect every time there is a new control uh, change, change value. Um, so with with, uh, with different values. So if I run this. No, the timer wasn't implemented, so that might be. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this, this, this code, again, is not production ready. There's, a, I'd say, a 50-50 chance of it crashing immediately. So um, I'll just run this again. I have one more tune for you, so. Right, so now if I plug in the MIDI controller, So we'll just start here. Now I change the MIDI controller. And you hear the echo change there. Now if I if I move this very rapidly, it will crash the app. The, the, the production works one well, works properly, but I'll try it one more time. And it's crashed. So 
yeah, can anyone name the tune? Yes, no surprises by Radiohead. <laughs> okay, um, right, I think that's about everything uh, we wanted to talk about. We're probably running it massively over time. Uh, we have a little bit left. We have oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so, in summary, the, the order that you open your input and output streams uh, is important. So, it, you, you need to rely on the input stream. So, open that first uh, and th then, then the output stream. Clear down the input stream uh, because you may get bad data when you first start <coughs> it. The, uh, the buffer sizes are also important. So, uh, use a up to one burst on the input stream, and we recommend two on the output. Uh, use the latest version of Oboe, which only just came out, so if you are using Oboe already, then upgrade, there should be uh, minimal code changes for you. And everything you see here, and with in a much better state, uh, work is available on GitHub, so if you do want a good starting point for an FX processing app, then uh, use the FX Lab app, uh, which Atme wrote, um, and it's all, all open source. So with that, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering if, if you wanted the lowest latency and you didn't, and you have an input stream and an output stream. Is it worth stopping the input stream when you're not using it to get more la like better latency? No, you're better off uh, just running with uh, zero latency, uh, zero buffer size on the input stream. So just okay. read it right down to zero and then start reading again. Right. Okay. But you risk uh, you risk underrunning on the output. Mm -hmm. um, but that might be a risk that you're willing to take. Yeah. Okay. In, in fact, in, in fairness. Um, Early callbacks, in our experience, are quite rare. Mm -hmm. So running with zero buffer on the input is, is feasible, depending on how risky you want to be. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I was wondering uh, when for example, you compare this kind of code uh, compared to Core Audio on OS X, uh, when you don't have to deal with all this uh, um, starting stuff uh, that you described, that you may have incorrect data, this kind of thing. Why can't you at least hide this kind of complexity into something that will, uh, well, developer will not have to deal with uh, this kind of complexity each time you want to do duplex audio processing? Yep. It's, it's kind of strange to have to do that each time, basically. So uh, the question, I mean, the, the question is why don't we uh, encapsulate all of this functionality in a single, like, duplex callback? Mm -hmm. um, historically, the, the reason why we haven't done it is because we haven't known the behavior of, of different devices. It's only very recently that we've had a full understanding of how different devices have performed and where they behave differently and where they're the same. So it's a very good point, and we actually have kind of a, a working implementation of a duplex callback in some of our classes, which may make it into to Oboe in the next release of Oboe. So yeah, it's, it's a fair point. And one thing to add to that uh, briefly, uh, I think a lot of um, a lot of Oboe is designed around the idea that different people who want to use like, who are tr trying to get the lowest possible latency or the highest performance on Android are willing to take more significant complexity in their code in order to do whatever optimizations they want to do. So we certainly gave one implementation uh, of this type of thing that we think would perform well, but certainly if you know things about your specific case, so for example, if you're not doing processing like continuously all the time, maybe your processing turns on and off, there are many other kind of optimizations and things to do. Uh, so we want to leave that as much as possible up to each specific uh, programmer. And then if less complexity is desired, you could always use the simpler Java APIs where latency isn't as much of a focus. Any other questions? 
Well, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Don and Atnea. Thank you.